Taco Bell, a future champion, swim techniques and Olympic strokes. Holding water, so much you will know about dolphin kicks, flip turns, dives, and how to find an awesome coach. Hosted by Brian Welter and Tyler Kearns. Holding water is where competitive swimming is learned. The song still gets me jacked, Brian, every time. Gets me ready to go. Um, hey, everybody out music. there. It is. It is. I, I hear it and and uh, gets me excited to talk about some age group swimming. Hey, everyone out there. Brian and Tyler back again for another episode of Holding Water. Um, Brian, six months into the show, man. Um, what, are you, what do you think so far? Hard to believe. Hard to believe. It, uh, it seems to have flown by, but... Uh... You know, hopefully seems to be being well received. So hopefully we can keep uh keep the guests coming and keep things going in the right direction. Yeah, just a just a reminder to everybody out there, this is the holding water uh webcast brought to you by Commit Swimming. Uh Commit Swimming software helps you manage your team's training and performance. Commit Swimming is trusted by thousands of coaches around the world, elite training centers, NCAA teams, high school swim clubs. 89 different countries are currently using Commit. When the, these coaches are asked about their experience with Commit, uh, it's clear uh, it changes their team for the better. Go to commit.com, commitswimming.com today to learn more and sign up for your free trial. You'll be blown away by the power and simplicity of Commit. So uh, we'll have a workout for you guys uh, in the Commit format. Brian, you want to introduce uh, today's game? Oh, did we lose yeah, him? I, I think we may have lost Brian for up there. Um, out, oh, there he is. I'm here. Yeah, I think I'm here. There you um, go. go ahead, man. But, uh, yeah, our guest today is a good friend of mine, a buddy of mine. I've talked talk swimming with uh, probably once or twice a week for the last, I don't know, five, six years at least probably. Um, he's done a great job down in the Tampa area, consistently producing, you know, top age group kids and top national level kids. Had a girl break the 500 free record, I think, the uh, couple years ago in the high school state meet. She was pretty good. 438, I think, was a pretty solid swim. Um, he's a buddy of mine. I'd like to bring him on. His name's Ryan Gober. He's at uh, in down in Tampa at Team. Hey, Ryan. Hey, guys. How are we doing? Ryan, what's up? You're good, man. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me today. Good. Thanks for coming. No us. problem, man. Thanks for coming on. We're Ryan, uh, tell me what's going on down there at team. What have you guys been up to? Uh, you know, uh, kind of like everybody else, fighting through this quarantine. Uh, we spent a little bit of time out of the pool. Uh, we've been lucky enough. We swim outside all the time. And so since we kind of got back in the water early in the summertime, we've worked through some periods of time with, uh, you know, few people in the lane to a little bit more people in the lane, a little bit more time and that kind of thing. Um, we were able to, to get in some meets. Um, you know, I know uh, we just got in uh, our high school meet, our high school state meet, our high school season, uh, a little bit different than, than normal, but we were able to get it in. And then uh, this past weekend, we just kind of finished our, I guess, our winter championship season with a Florida virtual championship meet. We had four championship meets around the LSC and, and with Florida Gold Coast, and uh, we were able to get to that. And um, it was it was a good meet out in unclear water for us. We were able to swim fast. And um, you know, the kids have been really good through it all. Uh, you know, it's been some hard times and, and different and challenging, but they've been with good attitude and good work. And, um, you know, actually just took, took a couple of days off to start the week this week and then got back into our holiday training. So it's been a good time. We're, we're excited to get into the holidays and, and get some good training in and into the spring and, and see what that holds. There's still some uncertainty of, of where we can be and where we're going to go as we lead through the spring and into the summer. But we're excited about the opportunity to, to figure it out. Now, uh, one of the things I think we we've talked about on this show, and and I'm sure Ryan, you and you and Brian have talked about this, is when quarantine hit, we uh, had a lot of teams kind of reevaluating their rest and when they give kids breaks and things like that. You said that you gave you guys a couple of days off early in the week. Is that something you traditionally do this time of year, or was it just something that you felt? No, was the it's end? it's definitely something new. Uh, normally, we would have taken a little bit more time off um, at the end of the summer into. Uh, our, our fall, I guess, um, with it, with the fact that we were out so much in the spring, we did not do that. Uh, and I did think that when we kind of finished through our high school season is a little bit stressful for the kids. 
um, like I'm sure everybody's is not only physically, but kind of emotionally and mentally. Uh, so we, we made sure that we got through that and then went through whatever we had at the rest of the winter, but we felt like it was a good time for them to kind of recharge. And, and you're right. I think that one of the things we are learning through this quarantine is that these kids need a little break. Um, they need time physically, they need time mentally, and emotionally, and, and probably so do we, uh, as coaches. And so it's definitely something we need to do better as a, as a sport. And, um, you know, we took those first three days off and, and we came back to the pool and honestly, until we went a little long course work this morning. Um, but before today, we, uh, we have some other act, uh, aquatic activities at our pool. And uh, we did a little bit of fun stuff to start the week on Friday. We had the synchronized swimming team out, the coaches out, and they ran our kids through a little synchro activities. And then yesterday we have a water polo team that's out of our pool. Uh, and they did that yesterday. So getting them back in the water, but not getting them back into traditional training until actually this morning. So it, I think it was good for everybody. Nice. How'd that synchro go? Uh, you know, uh, we have, if you want to check out our social media, we have our routine posted on our social <laughs> media. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, I guess would be the best word. Um, they, they, the kids actually, they gave it an honest effort and it was, I, I enjoyed it. I'm not sure they enjoyed it as much as I did, but I thought it was pretty, pretty hysterical. So and I'll tell you what, I know that we work on sculling and catching a lot of things as swim coaches, but you see what some of those synchro kids are able to do underwater their ability to put pressure on the water is pretty impressive and in, uh, in a lot of different directions yeah, yeah. I, I i love talking to our boys they they think they need to be in the gym more getting stronger but we can't scull ourselves out of the water i'm like you know all those muscles you have don't do us a whole lot if we can't move ourselves in the water so uh, we had that conversation on friday for sure brian what's your uh, what's your synchro routine look like over there at lakeside right now yeah we don't have a synchro routine um <laughs> we um uh, I'm actually at a swim meet right now. We've got our last meet of the season here in December. This is for all of our kids who didn't qualify for a, one of the other meets we had. So I'm sitting here in between sessions. I'm actually missing the boys, 100 I am right now. Um, but, you know, we're swimming pretty well. I mean, I thought I saw Joe's comment about the rest. I think one of the things that's been interesting and challenging about resting kids nowadays is I haven't really done any dry land. And so I've had to change around what I'm doing as far as rest because I just don't think the dry land, I think that we can't rest as much because I don't think we're as fit. And I don't think that the dry land, the lack of dry land has broken us down the way that the dry land would. So um, I've had to change kind of how I've rested kids, but it worked out pretty good. And luckily I've got a pretty good feel for that. So I, I've kind of got a knack for being able to get the kids rested, but We've been pretty yeah. good, so I've been happy. Um, I agree. I think so. coaches, if you guys are if you guys are out there, I mean, I'd love to and, and tuned in. I'd love to hear kind of what other coaches' experiences have been with rest because I think that's something that we've seen. I know down in Florida, you guys have uh, the gauntlet of three straight weeks in high school season where your kids are trying to go fast for three weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I don't know how you did that. The rest phase for that this year, and perhaps we'll get into that a little bit in the show. But you know, I, I think that the the hardest thing that Brian, like Brian said, the dry land has not been there. Some of the aerobic base and just natural supplement we got from long course season that you could normally transition in just was not there for a lot of kids. We were we were all happy to be in, and I think a lot of people went to this. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to go fast often and do a lot of that stuff when we returned back from quarantine. Um, and I wonder, would it been better to, to maybe start with some low grade aerobic and maintain that during that time when we got back in just because you, just that foundational stuff is, has been gone without long course sure. season. I think for us, uh, you know, in, in here in Florida, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I think for, I speak for a lot of Florida coaches, the fall becomes kind of a sprint, um, to the end of whether it be the high school season or their winter invites. And, and the base that you've built usually does come during that summertime, uh, during whether it be long course work or, or doubles and, or all those kind of things that you're just not getting in in the school year. And those didn't happen the same way that they have in the past. And so I think there was definitely a little bit of aerobic um, fitness that we lacked as a group on the whole. Um, and, and, you know, we tried to supplement that during quarantine with, a lot of, I mean, we zoomed dry land every single day. Uh, they were checking in with us with some other aerobic activities every single day. Um, so we feel like we got a lot of work done during that quarantine, but it's, you know, at some level, there's no way of replacing swimming. 
Uh, and, and we didn't get a lot of that in until the end of the summer and into the fall. And um, I think that, you know, it did kind of change the dynamic of, you know, and the other thing is for us, it felt like we, we, as a high school season, the season was shorter and we kind of compacted our, um, you know, meets into a smaller period of time. And then all of a sudden we had a lot more dual meets than we might normally have and spent a lot more time doing that this fall than we would normally would week to week and day to day. So I think that played a role in it. Do either of you guys ever feel like maybe a swim meet um, initiates a little bit of a taper in itself earlier in the season? Like if you have a swim meet that's three to four weeks out from maybe the big meet that you're focused on, um, and but you've got to have kids go to that meet because it may be a, a chance to qualify or or a last chance to kind of tune up. Do you ever feel like you ever worry about that gets you into maybe a taper phase with some of your 13, 14 year olds earlier than you would want? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, in the summertime, sectionals is a lot like that in our LSC. Our sectionals comes in kind of late June, early July. Uh, and then that those kids that would qualify for that level meet are, are you know, it's a big meet. It's important meet. We want to go. Um, but that's still a good three, four, maybe five, depending on what your end of summer meet is away. And, and yeah, it could initiate that rest phase a little bit earlier than you want to. I, I think so for sure. Yeah, I um, so we went to meet in November. And uh, I gave them a couple of days going into it and then we came out of it and we went right back to work. Um, I kind of back them up going into meets like that in season. Um, and then we come back and we don't, we don't time get meets. I use the meets as the first phase of our next training block um, in season. So we come out of the meet and we get right back to work and then, we use I that as well. We're losing Brian a little bit there. Brian, can you hear Brian? I can hear him. Yeah. I can hear. Yeah, I can. I can. I can hear you guys. So I, th- I don't think it's me. But uh, yeah, so I kind of, you know, I kind of set up into that. Um, I saw that comment. What was the comment there? They Show wanted to see your, your meat set up. Oh, how this meat is set up? Um. So this meet, we're going, this meet's three days, it's six sessions. We got two 10 and under sessions, two 11, 12 sessions, two open sessions. Um, so like the open kids swam Friday afternoon and they'll swim this afternoon. Um, 11 to 12 swam yesterday morning and this morning. Um, 10 and under swam Friday afternoon early and then they swam yesterday afternoon. So it's kind of a weird setup, but um it's pretty good because it gives everybody an opportunity to race and we've got enough kids in it to where they're actually getting some breaks between their events, which has been, I think one of the biggest problems that we've had is we've limited the number of athletes in all these meets. And unless you take big breaks in between your events, I mean, you're rolling through these sessions in an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 15 minutes. And these kids are swimming four races back to back to back to back. And And nothing kills easy. Nothing kills the energy of a meet like an empty pool too. And then you got to take these breaks and it's just yeah. dead water. Yeah. We were in Clearwater last weekend and in prelims, it was five minutes between strokes uh, and in, in finals, 10 minutes between strokes. And that, and it's still the prelims lasted from 9 a.m. to 1030 <laughs> and finals were five, five thirty to six thirty, even with those breaks. So we've got uh, about, in our open music session, we've got about, we got about 200 kids in our open sessions. Um, so they're running about three hours, a little over three hours, which is about right. So it's, it's been pretty good. The kids have had a chance to race. Um, I only entered my kids, most of them in three events instead of four. Um, just cause I was a little worried about how much turnaround time they were going to have. Um, and we kind of wanted just to see where we could get, you know, um, I think the other thing that's crazy is, we're not allowed to use our locker rooms or change. So if they want to wear a suit, they got to wear it to the pool. They got to warm up in it. They got to wear it during the meet and they got to wear it home and can't be comfortable. <laughs> I mean, most of my girls who rested two weeks ago decided not to wear a suit at this meet just because they didn't want to sit in it the whole time. Um, our COVID restrictions, basically, I mean, we're kind of doing the same thing everybody else is doing. You got to wear your mask to the blocks. You got to take them off, get on the block, swim your race, immediately put your mask back on. When you get out of the water, walk around, everything is traffic flow patterns. So it's all one big giant circle around the pool deck. Um, 
you go upstairs up one entrance you go you sit upstairs in the bleachers six feet apart you come down a different entrance there's a staging area and then they bring them to the blocks as you go we've been able to run at about a 45 second interval a little bit faster for some of the older kids but um it's getting back to somewhat normal um it's it's pretty good outside of the masks and everything and having to yell at the kids to wear the masks but <laughs> that's pretty much that's pretty much where we're at um and we've got pretty good at it we've run a lot of meets here so we, we've we've had a lot of practice um so the kids have figured out how to do it pretty well um you know i i don't i <laughs> I, I don't know when it's going to change, but I mean, I feel like we're at least getting a chance to, to swim some real events the way we need to. So I was happy with this weekend. I think we've done a good job. I got one more, one more session after I get done with this and then we'll see, get back to work. Well, um, Ryan, Ryan, we talked a little bit about just the, the transition from, like you said, that sprint to the end of the season for you guys in Florida and talked about a little bit how long course may have impacted you guys, but um, part of the, the focus for today, we'd love to talk to you about writing workouts and how you write workouts and the way you progress those through the season and uh, writing a workout with a goal in mind. So uh, you sure. were kind enough to send us a workout. We have a feature called the main set. So we're going to jump into that real quick and let you take us through a workout. All right. Yeah. So a, that's, go that's ahead. Me. There you go. Yeah. Go I, uh, you know, one of the things, and I talked to Brian, and, and like Brian said earlier, we talk a lot, uh, and him and I have pretty similar ideas in swimming, and um, it's kind of my thought process. You know, almost every day when we go to the pool that um, to swim fast, you have to swim fast. Um, and, you know, we, we do a decent amount of at-race pace. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're doing USRPT by any means, um, but we like to swim fast a lot, um, and we and that kind of trickles down through all of our ages, regardless of their uh, whether it be senior or age group and beyond. Um, I think that learning skills are important, doing things with a purpose, but, you know, doing them at a high speed. So um, I heard you guys talking a few weeks ago about what, what kind of events you base your training around. Um, and I feel like what we try to do is be really good at the 200 free and really good at the 200 IM. And I think from there we can kind of branch off into where we want to be and anything else. Um, you know, obviously I think there are some kids that are going to swim some longer things, uh, and we've had some success. Brian mentioned a young lady that's swam the 500 free at a really high level in high school. And, and she was really good at the mile and is still really good at the mile. Uh, so we feel like we can do those things if we need to, and we will do them with those athletes, but feel like if we can kind of put our bread and butter into swimming a really good 200 free and 200 IM, then we can succeed on the levels that we want to all around. So, um, just kind of jumping into it here, I guess we try to warm up and I try to make sure that we do everything with a purpose. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of swimming mindlessly. Uh, so even from the beginning here, we're going two 150s freestyle. They're doing an assigned number of dolphin kicks by 50. Um, we're going to go 100 progression. That's just kick right, left, swim for us. Um, that's going to be IM order by round. And then we're just trying to rev the engines a little bit by going variable speed, the same stroke as your progression. And we're going to go that three times so that we go around fly, around back, and around breast. Um, we try to do every stroke in our warm up pretty much every day as well. I think it's important to, no matter if you swim the 50 free, the thousand, the, the two IM, whatever, uh, that at least when you're warming up, you're kind of touching on everything. And um, we do a lot on Tuesdays. We call it the kids. I, I call it Teaching Tuesday. Uh, the kids get very excited for Tuesdays. We like to learn a little bit on Tuesdays, and we will spend some time drilling. And it might be turns and starts, but it also might be. A bunch of breaststroke that day and everybody's doing it regardless of what their their best event is um the next set i, I kind of focus on 100 stroke i think when it comes to 100 stroke we do enough work uh often enough where we're going to be able to finish our hundreds of stroke um i do think that one of the things we want to continue to develop always is our top end speed i think that a lot of times the kid that actually has the highest top end speed is the one that's going to finish and, and win, uh, you know, anybody or not anybody, but you can work on finishing, you can work on, you know, being good for being able to hold it together, but, um, you know, starting at that top end speed. So what we're doing here is just some 25s with a good amount of rest, uh, you know, it's six 25s at 35 fast. And then like we talked about in the pre-show, uh, we do what we call team free and team free for us is, is simply a smooth free. Uh, it is five dolphin kicks assigned for everybody off the wall. And then it is an assigned number of strokes per lap based on your, you know, the group you're in, your gender, that kind of thing. 
Uh, it might be 10 strokes. It might be up to 16 strokes, but I just want them swimming down with a purpose rather than just floating down. Um, pull, my favorite is when we pull on the lane rope and we're warming down or that kind of thing. So we're, we're, we're trying to do something a little different so that we're not doing that. We then go 425. So we're doing less of them, but a little bit faster interval. We do the 75, 225s uh, again, and then we're just going to go a 75 all out. Um, I think it's important, you know, that 75 all out, I'm trying to mimic as we've worn down a little bit, we're a little tired, trying to mimic the last 75 of our hundred uh, and see what you can do and race your teammates and, and, and get better. And then we warm down a little bit. So that's kind of just a short something we would do for our stroke. And when we do stroke, uh, you have to do flyback or rest. You're not doing free in our stroke stuff. Uh, we will, we'll do freestyle sometimes, but most of the time when we're going to do stroke, everybody's going flyback or rest. Um, also sometimes in those kind of things, we might, I've done that same exact set where we go two rounds and you go one primary and one secondary working on that other stroke as well. Um, the next, hey, Ryan, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Is that something you guys do regularly enough to where they know this is my 75. That's the back end, the last yeah. 75 of my hundred. Yeah. That's back, something we that's they would, they would, they would have done that a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay. and, and it's definitely something that we visit. Um, we talk and, and we try to talk and, and it's one of my goals. And I guess this kind of goes to making the sets is pretty much everything we put together. I feel like if somebody, if one of the kids or anybody else were to ask me why we're doing it, I feel like we should have a reason why we're doing it and, and how it correlates to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, sometimes that can be that we're trying to get tougher. Sometimes that's trying to, you know, work, I mean, you know, work together, whatever. It doesn't have to be, Hey, this is the exact, you know, replicates exactly to one of our events, but it better have a reason if we're going to do it. And I should be able to, and my coaches should be able to, you know, tell the athletes why we're doing it. I think, um, I think that's an important part of the process. Um, On to the 200 free set. Like I said, we try to do a lot of what we do based around being really good at the 200 free and the 200 IM. And I guess I'd like to say that we are pretty good at them most of the time. Um, we, we're going to do 625s here on a descending interval free with a shoot. Um, I want them to hold their 200 stroke count. They should know their stroke count um, when we're swimming at 200 free. And what I'm trying to do here is with the shoot, having them hold that stroke count, they're going to have to over kick on those 25s to be able to hold that stroke count. They're going to have to be really good off the wall and underwater, but they're also going to have to be really kick driven in those 25s. Uh, so we're trying to fatigue the legs before we go into our 200 pace stuff. So um, we're going really just three rounds here. You go to 625s and on round one, we're going 450s at 40 at 200 pace, 100 easy. On round two, they're going two 100s. And on round three, we're trying to swim that 200 as close to, to uh, race pace 200 as possible. Obviously, probably not going to go our 200 time, although we've gone some things in practice occasionally in this set. Um, you know, girls going 152s, 153s, things like that. Um, you know, guys guys under 150 that are that are pretty close to where we want to be and, 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 and have been really, really exciting during practice. But just trying to get our legs involved with the shoot and then uh, obviously go into that 200 pace stuff. Um, I, I think it's important to swim at pace and to try to replicate the races as much as possible. Um, after that, the last thing is, and I, I am not going to take credit for this one. I actually stole this from a friend of mine, Duncan Sherrard, that coaches, I guess, kind of in your area these days, Tyler and, and Auburn. And, uh, we, I talked to, when we, when I talk sprinting, I talk to Duncan a lot. Uh, I actually have a girl that's going to end up in Auburn not end up, but is going to Auburn next fall and going to swim with Duncan. And, um, I'm excited about that for her, but, uh, we talked about this a little bit. And so what they're going to do, and it says 25 on there, but what they do is they get on the wall and they're going to sprint kick for 15 seconds with their head in the water without breathing. So they have to just kick as fast as they can with their head on the water. I'm going to bang a wrench on the ladder. They get five seconds to kind of collect themselves. And then they're going to go at 25 free without a breath. Uh, and we do that sequence 12 times on a minute. Um, and that's an, old, I, uh, that's an old flow swimming uh, back in yeah. the day, the original, yes. float, one of those big flow swimming popular sets. Yeah. So I enjoy it. Uh, the kids actually enjoy a decent amount. Uh, we have made a, we made a conscious effort as a group uh, when we came back from quarantine that we were going to swim the 50 freestyle without a breath uh, as a, as a group. And, and that's something we talked about. And so we have done a lot more um, different things. One of the things we did is, we uh, had a little aerobic uh, heart rate challenge with Charlie Rose uh, and Blue Dolphin when we kind of came back, and all of our kids did a a broken 200 free where you all you're only allowed to breathe when you were on the wall, and you took your total time. You could spend as much time as you needed on the wall, 
um, but you, you could only breathe when you're on the wall. And we recorded their times and we did it about once every week to once every other week. And Charlie and I would send back our, uh, our results from those and compare and contrast our top five and his top five and that kind of thing. And um, I think it helped us. And I think it was one of the ways that we were kind of checking where we were aerobically, as we talked about um, coming back from quarantine, but uh, we we're trying to swim more fifties without a breath. I think if you want to do the 50 and elite level, you have to swim without a breath. And so we've made a conscious effort as a group to try to do that. And then we just do a little warm down. And when we warm down, we try to kick every day. Cause I think that you have to kick when you're warming down and that's not a dramatic amount of kick in this one, but uh, we do mix a little bit of kicking and swimming when we're warming down. So that's what we do pretty much. Uh, that's, I, I would say that's a pretty good example of what our workouts look like on a daily basis. That's good stuff. Now, uh, just a couple of things. Like for me, you mentioned in there writing workouts with a goal in mind. Mm -hmm. For me, if I'm writing a workout, there's like I try to have it's either skill focused or pace focused. Mm -hmm. um, it may be energy system specific. Um, and, and occasionally that's just a set to, to, to generate some toughness for us. Is that kind of what you're talking about as far as or are you talking more specifically to I'm writing a workout with an athlete in mind or a group of athletes in mind. No. So we, I, I would say that we were that I write most of our workouts um, based on trying to touch all of the events throughout the week. And then we do mix in, like I said, on Tuesdays, Tuesdays is going to be a skill day for us all the time. Uh, Tuesdays is going to be a skill day and Friday is normally going to be a stations day for us. Uh, and then the rest of the week, we, we try to make sure that we, we touch the tuner free and the tuner I am a lot as kind of major, major, I would say if I, if the main set was a focus, it's focused on that. And then I make sure that we visit some sprinting, we visit some stroke. Uh, and then we do break up occasionally as well into, you know, we might take two or three times a week where we break up separate of sprint and distance. Um, but no, it would be a focus on making sure that I feel like we are, we're doing the things we need to do to say that we've touched uh, a lot of different events. Uh, we try to, to train, as event specific as possible in regards to the way a set is written. Uh, and, and we try to train that way. It, it's not necessarily made for any particular athlete. Um, like I said, I'd like all of our kids to swim a good 200 free and a good 200 IM. And then from there, I think that we can venture off into the things that they need to. Um, we've got to make sure that we're kicking enough. I think kicking is very important. Um, and so we try to kick a lot of days. Um, you know, obviously that Firestone set, had some kicking in there. So that was probably the kicking for that particular day. Um, but I would say we kick in some amount every single day. Uh, and then from there, I, I mainly write our, our main set kind of kick set or main set and secondary set, and then kind of build a warm up uh, based on what we're doing that day. Not, I don't normally start writing workouts with the warm up and then kind of see where it goes. Uh, our weeks are pretty similar week to week. And I know what we're trying to accomplish day to day. And then, you know, we, we kind of put it together that way. So I do with the kicking stuff, I do something a little bit different. I started doing it a while back. We go pretty much on Friday afternoons. We do the whole practice kick. We'll go 4,000 to 6,000 yards of kicking, um, pretty much almost all kick. And uh, then we only do between maybe four and 800 yards of kick a day mixed into the warm up. Um, but I feel like we've had pretty good results doing it like that. And the kids who like to kick like to come to Friday practices. And the kids who don't like to kick get it out of the way in one workout. So they're happy about that. Um, <laughs> they're not happy at that practice, but they're happy that that's the one day that they have to do that. Um, we started doing that a while back. Um, and I feel like it's really helped us. We've gotten a lot better at kicking and we're pretty good about kicking when we swim. So um, Brian, Brian, do you like, mix up the, do you mix up the, maybe the, the target energy system when you're doing those Friday kick sets or is it always fairly aerobic kicking or is it always, you know, trying to kick fast? Um, I, I kind of do like a rainbow practice with the kicking stuff. We'll do some initial speed kicking where we're working on just going 15 meters as fast as you can go. We'll do some aerobic kicking. Um, I try to, I'm really bad about changing my intervals up. I pretty much do everything kick on a 30 second per 25 base. Um, and we don't ever kick slow. Um, that's something we just don't do. Uh, my kids all talk about how you need to do a social kick. And I'm like, yeah, keep dreaming. It's never going to happen. I've been doing this 30 years and I've never done a social kick and I'm not going to start now. Um, so I, I just, I think that 
I think if you do a lot of kicking in a row and you go four or 5,000 yards of kicking, you get a lot stronger. And um, I think if you mix it up, the one thing I haven't figured out how to balance is I don't know how to work breaststroke kick in there and be able to maintain a heart rate. Um, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that. I feel like our breaststroke kickers that are good at it are good at it, but they don't have to get their heart rate up to be able to make the intervals or to keep up. And I feel like our breaststroke kickers that suck at breaststroke kick just don't even try most of the time on breaststroke kick because they've just kind of given up on it. And part of that may be my fault because we're kind of like Ryan talked about. We're pretty specific in what we focus on just because in being in Texas here, these tag times are pretty ridiculous. So if you don't get pretty specific pretty early on, you're going to have a tough time even making it to the championship meet. So, I mean, I think like our girls 200 butterfly tags time is 212.4. You've got to be pretty good 200 butterfly for a 13, 14 girl to go 212. Um, yeah, you can swim you know, for sure. There's no doubt. That's not playing around. And that's just to get to the meat. Um, yeah. So you've got to get pretty specific. So we do a lot of stuff like Ryan was talking about, like that set of 25s where they'll, I'll have butterflyers that'll go. If we did that set, we'd probably go three rounds of it. And I'll have butterflyers that'll go two to three rounds all fly. I mean, that's just what they do. And yeah, and I don't necessarily dictate that. Um, Got a question here, Brian, uh, and both, for both of you guys, Brian and Ryan, what are your opinions <laughs> about kicking with a board versus a, kicking with a snorkel and streamline? Anybody uh, want to jump easy. in on that? Go ahead, Brian. It's easy because I don't use snorkels, so <laughs> that's not an option for me. Um, we do a fair amount of kicking on a board. We do a fair amount of kicking without a board. I do really like streamlined backstroke kick. I think it's really important if you're going to develop your backstroke to be able to kick in a streamline fast. Um, I think that's that's a big thing. The other thing we do a lot of um, that I stole from John Morris and Charlie Hodgson is uh, we do a lot of fly kick on our back with our arms at our side, our using side. our yep. arms, using our arms, and we try to work on timing the finish of the stroke with the kick. Um, and I think it helps them. It helps them with the rhythm and their timing, um, and it makes them a lot stronger. Um, so we do a lot of that. Um, we mix some of that in almost every day uh, with some streamlined back kick and some fly kick on your back arms and your sides. Um, but outside of that, we do we do a fair amount of freestyle kick on a board. I think freestyle kick on a board's uh, pre pretty good stuff, and uh, I think it's pretty hard. I, I like hard. I like heart rates to come up, and I like to get that the blood pumping. And I, I think kicking is a real good way to do that. And I, the other thing with kicking is there's really no way to fake it. Yeah. You know, if you you got to if you're going hard, you're going hard. I mean, there's no way to fake it. You can't, you know, kick kind of hard. I mean, you can, but it's pretty obvious. You know. Yeah. So. Um, Ryan, what we, are your we, thoughts on that? Using so that I actually kind of like a combination. Uh, I'm a big fan of kicking with the board and the snorkel. Uh, so you're holding kind of mid board, uh, with the snorkel on. So I, I do think I, we kick with a board without snorkel a good bit as well, but I do think that it creates some, some poor body position occasionally where our hips are a little low and our head is high. Uh, so we will put snorkels on sometimes while we're kicking with a board and just have them get that head down and it helps them get their hips up. Uh, I'm also a big fan and big proponent of kicking on your back in a streamline. Uh, I had a, a young lady that swam for me that the same girl Brian was referencing that in the 500 freestyle that said that she felt like she had better legs in her freestyle the more kicking on our back in a streamline we did. Uh, and so we, we, you know, obviously we were doing a lot of it then and we had gotten away from it for a little while. Uh, and, and after having that kind of conversation with her, we, we've gotten back to it a lot more where I think kicking on your back in a streamline is – the other thing I don't like about kicking with a board is it eliminates the underwater dolphin kicks a little bit. Uh, and I think that that should be done a lot. So I like the kicking on your back in a streamline to – to increase those dolphin kicks as well. So. All right, I'm going to jump in here. I have a, a very specific rule about breaststroke kick. There's no slow breaststroke kick allowed in my group ever. I can't stand to watch it. It's just a total, in my opinion at least, it's just a total waste of time. Mm -hmm. Now, when they're younger and you're trying to teach them the path of the kick, I think that's different. But once you get into my 11 to 14-year-old group, um, we should have that down and we should really be able to be snappy and, and work on that surge uh, from a breaststroke kick. So I, I, I believe pretty firmly in that. My kids will tell you, number one rule of breaststroke kick is there's no slow, slow breaststroke kick. Um, as far as kicking on a board, 
um, you know, it was really interesting that that Swimming Science website came out a few weeks or maybe a month ago with uh, an article that said you should never kick on a board ever, never do freestyle kick on a board. Um, and and I don't particularly like to deal in absolutes, especially in the sport of swimming, when we know that there's coaches doing it with USRPT and having kids go fast and coaches that are swimming with the volume based uh, training utilization over specificity. And so I, I think that the, there's uh, there's got to be room in there to slide across that scale to where, like Ryan said, you can you can do a variety of kicking. You can kick on the wall. You can kick with a board. You can kick with a snorkel and body position, which I love for freestyle kick. Um, and like both of these guys said, you know, if you can't do 25s repeat on 30 seconds, stream on kicking on your back, you're probably not ready for our 11 to 14 group. Uh, and you should be able to repeat those like Randy said a few weeks ago on the show to the point of where you can feel your level of fatigue and when that happens. But I do love kicking with the snorkel. I know Brian doesn't like a lot of equipment. Um, but I, I like the uh, I love the idea of, of working that interior chain and, and forcing your body to stay in that soft end front line where your head is down and you can really work on that driving kick without a breath or a lift to get the, the body position out of line. So I do love a I do love a prone body position kick with a snorkel on. So. So I, I just you, you mentioned kicking on the wall. I have to say there have been times recently where I have felt like the highest effort level kicking we get is when we're kicking on the wall. Uh, and, and I don't know why that is, but I, sometimes it feels like we, when we kick on the wall, we are really kicking. Um, and so we have done a little bit more of that lately and kind of kicking on the wall into trying to carry that good kick into swim or whatever it may be. So are you having them go hands by their side or staggered hands, uh, hands by their side usually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I found that when they go staggered hands, it allows that bottom hand to push the hips into the get that interior chain up sure. and lets the hips sit really high on top of the water. Um, so I get a lot of good tempo from the kick there. Sometimes we get a little bit too much air okay. on the top end of that upswing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've moved to more of a double arm when we do a kick set like that where and, and I like to do it into an open turn where mm -hmm. we're working on a mm -hmm. skill or we sprint freestyle kick, but then snap into that open turn and, and go around that open turn. Sure. Um, and then um, we got a question here. Joe popped in a question about kicking in two feet deep kicking, um, trying to kick really, I guess, trying to kick really deep in the water and force that up and down kick, I think is, is what Joe's asking. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, I, I try to generally keep as much of flutter kick at the surface right at and under the surface as possible. Not a lot of air, not a lot of depth, unless a kid just has a really big natural pronation to their foot. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I've had some, uh, Paige Madden was one of my kids that I had from, you know, younger age from eight to like 14 and was probably the best kicker that I've seen, especially when she was on a board. Um, she just had a great natural pronation to her kick. And so she, she rode that kick throughout all of her swims. Um, pretty much forever. Um, I don't know. Brian, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I've got a girl right now that um, she may be one of the best kickers I've ever coached. Um, she's She was uh, 53 in the 100 free and 24 in the 50 as an 11-year-old at Tags, won both of them. And she comes off of the wall and puts the legs into gear and nobody can nobody can touch her. But she's got a bigger kick. It's probably a lot of coaches would probably shorten it up and try to keep it under the water a little bit more. But I mean, we do 400 kick for time and she just crushes everybody. She'll be 30 seconds ahead of everybody on a board. Um, so I the way I look at it is she's probably smarter than I am. So I'm just going to leave it alone. <laughs> um, you know, um, but I mean, literally 200 freestyle two weeks ago at our championship meet, she came off the last wall. And she was right with another girl. And I looked at the assistant coach and I said, this, this is over. She came off the wall, put the legs into gear and just went right by her like she was standing still. So I, I think there's something to be said for a kid that can kick like that, that's that natural at it. So um, we do a fair amount of kicking. I mean, we do, we do, 
we we do a fair amount of kicking on a board. I think kicking on a board's pretty good, so I try to stick with that. And and I think kids that are good at kicking are good at kicking on a board too, usually. Um, but you do. I mean, you and I talked about this with Russell. You do have your Alex Zettles of the world. They can't. He that kid can't. And his brother's the same way, Andrew. I mean, they can't kick on a board to save their lives. But when they decide to go to the legs, I mean, Ryan, you've seen them. When they decide to go to the legs at the end of a race, whew, see you later. I mean, mm-hmm. so I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there's a direct correlation there for everybody, but I think it's something you got to keep an eye on. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't change kids kick around that much unless it's really, really bad. I kind of just let kids figure out how to do it and, and grow into it. Um, but that's kind of my theory toward everything. Yeah, Ryan, so, for for you, when you've got Tankersley and some of those kids who have been very successful with you over the past five to, to ten years or so, um, how important is is kicking in the in the component of of your practices? I know you said earlier you you kind of write it into um, your practices, but I mean, how often? I mean, are you are you targeting a percentage of kicking in practice, or are you just trying to go fast with it? No, I wouldn't say it's a certain percentage, although it ends up probably being. Uh, you know, maybe a quarter, uh, maybe a little, maybe 20% in that range. A lot of times, um, I, I just think it's critical to, to, and, 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 you know, I, I think Brian's right. And, and you guys are talking about it. Like, it's not necessarily always, does it directly correlate? Uh, I've seen a lot of kids that are really great kickers with boards that don't do a good job of, of changing that flutter kick with the board into swimming and then vice versa girls that can go 22 low in the 50 free, but then when you kick with a board, you're like, what, where are your legs? Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't directly correlate, but at the same time, I think that um, it's a critical component. I think it's our motor, if you will. Uh, and, and I think it's something that we try to do a decent amount. Um, and then obviously it, when it comes to resting, it's something you got to be uh, you know, careful of as well, I think. Yeah. And I mean, it's a massive, muscle group too. I mean, you mm-hmm. got to think about the fact that if you're going to be like you've said, 200 free and 200 IM, you want to go to that, the legs on the last 50 of those, you have to have trained that heart to be able to push blood and, and keep filling up those legs to be able to, to, to turn up the tempo at the end. Sure. Um, so well, Ryan, you said something right there that, that is a big thing for me. Um, I, I'm real scared to kick in the last two weeks of the season. I stay off the legs pretty much unless we're doing pace work. We don't really do any kicking at all the last two weeks. Um, I don't know why I started doing that. I think it's probably a thing I picked up from John Morse, but um, yeah, I, I, I back way off the legs and try to let the legs recover. Um, we'll so try to break them down pretty hard two weeks, two weeks before that. So the last, the third and fourth week out, we'll try to get on them pretty hard. And then with the last two weeks, we pretty much come off them all together. I would argue that for us, the, 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 eh, the only kicking we're really doing in that kind of time is initial speed type kicking, uh, very short burst, uh, move, make sure the legs are still ready to move and, and that kind of stuff, but, but certainly not kicking, uh, a whole lot and, and not, and not back to back or anything, you know, just make sure the legs are ready to rev up that kind of thing. Um, but other than that, we're, we're laying off them as well. So, I mean, I, I try to incorporate the, the legs into, like you said, the underwaters and the breakout component, because I think it's important to maintain that feel of kind of surface awareness as you're trying to get up and go fast, because as your body transitions from maybe being a little bit more tired and broken down to being a little more fresh, you're going to get to that surface a little bit differently than you would mm-hmm. in the middle of a 4,500 to 5,500 yard workout. You're going to be able to get to that surface a little bit um, more dynamically. And in the way that you uh, break out is going to, is going to change. I I saw a good video that Bobby Gunturo posted. I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, but it was, um, I think Coleman Stewart demonstrating an underwater dolphin kick through a breakout. It was beautiful. Just Mm -hmm. a really, really great transition. So that transition kick is something I try to talk about a lot. During yeah, and I, it, 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 it kind of piggybacking on what you're saying there. I always worry with that about elite butterfly or backstrokers that are elite underwater, and all of a sudden, are we going to be, um, you know, one or kick the two kicks better than we've been before? And then are we pushing the 15 meter marker? Yep, or something like that. Like, are we are we more fresh, and we're going to put a suit on, and then all of a sudden we're going to blow past 15 meters because we've been doing 12 kicks or whatever it is off the start, and now we're going to be 
you know, <laughs> a meter and a half by or something like, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's definitely something I worry about. And so we, I think we practice it mainly for that reason, just to make sure we're, you know, and, and even, even during that time, we might even kind of talk to them about, you know, being a yard short or whatever, because when we are going to put the suit on, I, I just, I have this fear of us, you know, uh, you know, showing up the first night of, in the medley relay and going by <laughs> the backstroke or whatever the case may be. So. Well, word, you word is to, your relay. You just need to go to Fonders meets where they don't call any of that stuff. <laughs> word is your uh, your relays have been pretty good uh, lately, but we, we yeah, yeah. Start. I, I, I know friend, Joe. Uh, Joe was excited about the way we swam the relays last weekend <laughs> in Clearwater. Uh, you know, we we swam the two hundred free relay on Friday, and I think he thought he was going to win, and he didn't. And then he had some words for me and the group on mm -hmm. Saturday about how there was no chance we we're going to win the medley relay, and I think that one went worse for them. So, wow. Uh, Boo, yeah. Joe, Joe, Joe. This is all in good humor, folks. This is all friends <laughs> talking here. Um, I, good question. Uh, another question in here from from Tom, who's put in some good stuff today. So, Tom, thanks. Um, about your ratio of kicking with and without fins, Brian. I know your answer is going to be a little bit unique because you have a different style of kicking um, with fins. But there's a, a follow up to it. Do do you guys use breaststroke fins? Um, are there anything good like that out there? Welter, what you got, um, I, man? So we, we do a lot of, well, we haven't recently, but we're going to get back on it starting tomorrow. We're going to do some weighted fins. Um, so we do that, and we do a fair amount of that. Um, I don't do as much kicking with weighted fins as I would do without weighted fins or as I would do with regular fins just because I do think it'll, it'll beat you up pretty good. Um, it takes about three to four weeks to rest the kids off of weighted fins. So that lets me know that that's pretty hard. Um, and then we, so breaststroke fins, I've played with a lot. Um, what I've found with breaststroke fins, the Speedo breaststroke fins, um, is the kids that are really natural breaststroke kickers that have a lot of power in their breaststroke kick hate them. And kids that aren't very good with breaststroke kick really like them. Um, yeah. And they do help them figure out how to hold on to the water. Um, we actually switched over to those I don't even know what they're called. Those stupid looking cup things. They're like a, it's like a PDS. paddle almost. PDS, yeah. they're called PDS, positive PDS. drive fan. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we switched over to some of those. We've got some kids that are using some of those. And some of my, my good breaststroke kickers who hate breaststroke fins kind of like those things. Um, so we've played with those a little bit. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. And I've got a cup. I've got a couple sets of those breaststroke fins that I'll stick on kids periodically if I see something. But we don't use them consistently. I wouldn't say. Um, I don't use you, fins regular. I don't use regular fins a lot either, though. So we don't use breaststroke fins at all. Um, and I would argue that we don't kick with fins tons. Uh, my kids might argue with you differently, though. Uh, they probably think that we use them more than I think that we use them. Uh, they're not. We're not, we're, and I don't know if it's the group I have or whatever the case may be, um, but they're not huge fans of fins. And, and a lot of them, it bothers their feet, bothers their ankles, whatever the case may be. Um, so we do it a decent amount. When we're going to do it, a lot of it is underwater. Uh, we do a decent amount of underwater stuff with fins, but um, very rarely are we just putting a board on, you know, grabbing a board and fin kicking. Um, a lot, if we do, a lot of times it's in a progression. I like to go, we do a lot of stuff resistance to assistance. Um, and so we might go a, a set that we do round one with a shoot, round two, no fins or no equipment, and round three with fins. Um, and, and, you know, obviously changing the intervals, but let's say it's, you know, 825s or 50s or whatever it is, uh, and you're kicking round one with the resistance of a shoot and then kicking round two with no no resistance or assistance and then kicking that third round with, with assistance. And so if we are kicking with fins, it's usually something like that. So not tons of time spent kicking with fins for us. What about you, yeah. Tyler? Yeah, I, we actually do use fins, not uh, a ton when they're younger. I like them to use the long fins for teaching purposes, mm -hmm. uh, just for body position and going through uh, maybe some drills. Um, when they're, if I'm taking a young group of kids, eight, nine, 10 through a drill progression, I like those guys to have fins so they can really feel themselves on top of the water. Um, we don't use breaststroke fins. I've just never had a really good feel for, um, uh, incorporating them into workout because, you know, it may have two or three sets and that's two or three kids using them and then 22 kids not using them. 
Uh, and and I do have seen a I have seen a little bit of an experience with when they get to the finish of that breaststroke kick with those fins, it forces that up kick at the end that sometimes turns into a dolphin kick um, that I'm I'm always weary of when teaching breaststroke. Um, we do use like Ryan said fins when we're doing a lot of underwater stuff in the year so that we can teach that that drive. Uh, but one thing I have seen a lot of that I worry about is when they have the fins. A lot of them kick a little bit more straight leg than I would want them to. Uh, and I think that's something that they get taught a lot when they're younger is don't bend your knees a lot when you kick. Uh, and when you have a fin, you can fake that a little bit. You don't have to bend the knee to get as much of that load into the kick. And so as they get older and we kind of take the fins off and we're trying to kick a lot, uh, I try to boost up that ratio of, of kicking without fins, uh, A, because they should be getting that aerobic development in their legs, but also be, I want them to bend the knees a little bit more, almost like they're kicking a soccer ball rather than, you know, I, I jokingly say it's not like you have a, a leaf on the end of your shoe and you're just trying to kick the leaf off. It's, it's like you're loading up and kicking a soccer ball so that you're kicking hard in that direction, but also forcing yourself to load the freestyle kick back up. Um, and I think you get a lot of that, Ryan, you said earlier, streamline kicking on your back forces you to load that down kick position in the, in the backstroke kick. So um, we do use fins, but mostly during teaching, not a lot during a straight up kick. So yeah. I would say we do a lot of it with teaching as well, just for, like you said, that increased body position or, or maybe a little bit of propulsion more to help you with whatever drill you're doing. Do you guys find that you said faking it there, Tyler, do you find that you have any or some amount of kids that aren't necessarily good kickers without fins, but are exceptional kickers with fins? Um, that, that it's very clear that they're faking it with the fins, if you will. Uh, me, I was one, 100%. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was, I was God awful in practice. And, uh, I used to irritate the heck out of my sister who was just a great 200 freestyler. Um, and I was uh, four years older than her. And so when we would be in practice and she would just be destroying me, I'd be over in lane six in the sprint lane. And uh, at the end of practice on like Tuesdays, we would put on fins or fins and paddles and do some repeat 100s. And then I would all of a sudden be relevant in the practice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. I've got kids that do that. And, I, you know, for me, the harder I tried to kick without fins, I feel like I went backwards when I tried to kick hard like that. So I've got a couple of kids like that with, with zero ankle flexibility. Uh, and they just they can't get that load into the kick. Um, but I have, like you mentioned earlier, or you or Brian, I can't remember who it was. We've got some kids that are really good kickers on a board and I've had a hard time incorporating that into a freestyle race. So yeah. I don't know if you guys have any tips for me there. So but we have been, we've been doing a lot of um, going straight from board kicking or not a lot of, I guess maybe we need to do more going from board kicking into catch up with a stick and trying to kind of swim fast, catch up with the stick. Uh, and that's kind of how we've been trying to incorporate that kicking with a board into swimming fast um, with the kick um, and, and just trying to go fast with the catch up with the stick and trying to be quicker. I figure if we can do that, then you know, eventually we can swim. So, Yeah, we go. So if we go a threshold set, we'll go a threshold set. And then at the end of that, we'll go a hundred fast free kick um, at the end of the round. We do a lot of that um, mixing that kick into that set. Um, pretty much the only time I really use fins during practice, um, I may mix them into a kick set or something, but we use them a lot on the initial speed, speed development stuff, just to try to get a feel of going fast and just changing it up a little bit. So we use them a lot there, but that's, that's pretty much it. And that's usually swim. That's usually not kick. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with it. But, you know, I, 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 I like fins to a degree, but I also think you can become fin dependent. Um, and I think that some kids like Tyler's talking about that can kick with fins that can't kick at all. They always want to use fins and I think they, they don't get a lot out of it. You know, um, and I think some coaches definitely use that as a crutch to get through kicking in a relative rate so they can get the volume in that they want to get in. And I think that's a mistake. So I've got one that I've tried to, uh, Ryan, just like you said, I've been big on, you know, we'll finish up warm up with, with, you know, eight, nine, 10 fifties on a stick, like trying to just activate the legs into the the stroke. But we've also, uh, finished up and we'll do some of this over Christmas training where 
we'll do some variable speed at the end of our warm up, and then right when we're done, like you like both of you guys said, grab a kickboard real quick. We're gonna go a hundred all out kick for time, and they don't know that thirty minutes later after we finish a preset, I'm coming back to six one hundreds, and now I have a time for mm. what they should be able to go on a hundred kick fast, and it's we're gonna go six one hundreds on maybe a looser interval, maybe it's two two thirty something like that, but you've got to match what you kicked on that for it to count. Right. Um, so you do, you do until you go six, until you hit six of those matching that time, just as a way to kind of trick them into kicking fast and then trick them into repeating kicking fast. Yeah. I love that. One of the things so, we talk about a lot and it's a Brianism now, um, oh. is I always start off with, if you're not kicking and they all have to say, you're not trying. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much, pretty much how we do it. And so, I'll have kids come into the wall and I'll just look at them and go, if you're not kicking and they just put their head down and go, you're not trying. And that's just <laughs> kind of how, that's kind of how we correlate getting the kicking involved. Um, Cause I mean, from my standpoint as a coach, if you're not kicking, I just don't think the effort level is where it needs to be. I mean, sure. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I mean, even nowadays distance kids, I mean, you, we're talking about tank. I mean, she maintained a six beat kick or an eight beat kick all the way through that 438 500 and was like at a 10 or 12 beat kick when she went what 45 in the 200. I mean, that's a distance kick 437 and 44. Yeah, oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> Get it right, guy. Good gracious. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I mean, it you. wasn't like I was wasn't like I was there. I was getting I was too busy getting the rest of your girls split, so I didn't get to watch her. Yeah. <laughs> what's uh what's a what you, we I feel like we've learned a lot of welterisms on this show. Gober, what's something your kids hear you say a lot at practice? Uh, our main thing is just be, become be uh, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, that's our main thing that we go to all the time. Uh, you just got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, uh, and and we try to live with that. And, and I think that that's kind of where we need to be. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we, we are ready to swim fast at any time in my, in my opinion. Um, and, and you just need to be ready to swim fast. And, um, I, I don't think that it needs to be a certain day of the week or a time of the year or whatever the case may be. Um, I, you know, obviously it might not be the best swim of our life, but I think we can swim fast at any given time. And, um, that's a decision that we make or we don't make. And, um, you know, so we kind of go by that and then sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable, but you got to be willing to be uncomfortable. So, yeah, I, uh, I'll I phrase that. it as uh, do what you're supposed to do, not what you want to do, mm. do, do when it's hard, do what you are supposed to do, not what you want to do to make it less hard. Sure. Um, and then as you practice, so you race, that's one that we've said for the 15 years I've been here, it's been something that we've kind of stuck to is you go to a swim meet for two reasons to excel or to get exposed. So you're excelling for the things you've done or you're getting exposed for the things you have. Those are the two like reasons that. to show up at this one meet. Yeah, I like that too. Um, I, I will say that 400 medley relay challenge thing was really good for us as far as understanding that we can swim fast in practice and we can swim fast with, you know, whatever the obstacle might be because they got excited about that and we had kids going – you know, I mean, that girl that let off the backstroke for me was 50. Her best time was 103 flat, and she, I had her 59.7. He got her double oo But um, that's did a you see the Carmel boys? I, yeah, that's some swimming. Not. That is I I, 324 is a bunch of 13, 14 year old boys in the medley relay. Yeah. Is real swimming. That is that, that is, is legit swimming. Yeah, yeah they were uh, good they were, no matter who you are, almost. 100%. That's what our national boys win at our site. Yeah. And they're pretty good. <laughs> um, so yeah, 13, 14, that's diesel. But I think that's that, that kind of stuff is good. And I think that doing that kind of stuff definitely helps the kids. And I, you know, we got to a point now, I, I feel like this is the first group of kids in a long time that I've had that don't always want to put a suit on and understand that they can go to a meet and swim fast in a regular suit. And they don't want, I mean, I have most of my kids opted not to put a suit on at this meet and they're swimming pretty fast without it. And I think that's a definite toughness thing, and I think that definitely helps. I think sometimes you get a little dependent on suits and the magic that our, that Speedo and yeah. Tier are selling us. <laughs> Speedo. Speedo. Speedo selling, yeah. That one. Speedo is selling me and my team. Mike DeBoer was right. Like, episode two, 
made a comment about another brand and it was probably not a good idea. Um, hey, Ryan, I know we're, we're running arena, up hard on. So we say we're arena. There you go. Go you arena. Get your pitch. <laughs> um, we're running up hard on the hour, but I, I do have one more thing. So if you guys are watching, um, just you, we're talking about some of the athletes that you've been able to develop, but you had some of those girls in your group as 11 and 12 year olds, correct? Sure. Sure. So uh, yeah. when, when you're taking a, a, a young lady or, or even a young guy from an 11 and 12 group uh, and, and the goal is to make them successful at the, the top end before they leave your program to be ready to, for me, it's to get their best opportunity to go swim at the best place for them. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be the best place for me, but the best fit for them. Um, what are some of the things that, that you may hold back on that, uh, that are out there? You know, is it weights? Is it resistance? Is it speed? But you've got this really great 11 and 12 year old, um, but you know, you want to have a great kid for the next six to seven years. Sure. I think, I mean, first and foremost, I agree with you. I think it's always our goal to find the right place for kids. Uh, and I want to, and, and we want to send kids to college and, and have them be able to get better and succeed. I, I don't want to be a place or we don't want to be a place where we have, have you know, I, I, we want to get the most out of the kids, but we don't, also don't want to be a place where we've tapped the kids out uh, and then they're going to go off to college and there's no room for them to grow and, and develop and that kind of thing. And so we want to send the kids to college in a place where they can get better and, and they find the place that's right for them and they can succeed in the pool and in the classroom and, and personally and all that kind of stuff. Um, for me, when it comes to being 11 and 12, it's, it's, it's a little bit of everything. I think, you know, the dry land, you have to be doing it the right way. Uh, I think dry land is important. I think that dry land is important for that age because, and it's becoming more and more important in my opinion, because of the lack of whether it be PE at school or just simply running around the neighborhood that happens, uh, with that age kid that used to happen when we were younger or maybe, you know, even before us or after us. Um, I think that that is important. Climbing trees and jumping fences. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you rode your bike and jumped off the curb and that's kind of, that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. I mean, I remember doing a camp uh, maybe a handful of years ago with a bunch of 11 and 12 year olds. And I was trying to use somersaulting on land as a demonstration for flip turns. And I had a group of 12 and like four to five of them couldn't do a somersault. And I'm like, how do you not know how to do a somersault when you're a middle, you know, 11, 12 year old, uh, and, and but that and then it makes it hard to teach them to do a flip turn if they don't know how to do a somersault or how to imperfect a flip turn. So I think it's important for them to do. It just has to be done right. When it comes to resistance training, same way. I think you have to do it. I think it's good to introduce it to them, um, but you have to do it right. For me, it's simply just amount of time spent at the pool, amount of you know just the simple pressure that we put on them. Um, one of the things that we've started doing post quarantine is. We, we, except for once to twice a week, we don't swim longer than 90 minutes. We don't, we don't at all. Uh, I think we can get the work done and we can warm up. We can get some more of the work we need done. We can warm down. Now that might've added us some sessions in my opinion, which I think is more like a prelim final meet for our older kids anyways. But we don't, I don't feel like we need to be at the pool for grinding for two and a half, three hours at any time. And certainly not when they're 11, 12, 13, that kind of thing maybe for a girl that's 13 or whatever the case may be, maybe. But for the most part, I think that it's, it's not, you get the aerobic work in, but we just don't simply have to be on top of them all the time. I, I, it's, it's my job and our job as coaches to keep swimming fun all the time and, and make them want to keep coming. Uh, and you can do a lot of work and it can be hard and still be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked for Ed Brennan for a long time. And one of the things that he used to always say is that if it's not fun to watch, it's not fun to do. And there are plenty of things that are, that are fun to watch that probably aren't fun to do, um, but it better be at least fun to watch when we're doing it. And that's kind of how we, we do things. And, um, you know, I think that that's important and even more important when their age is 10 to 14 to make sure it's fun yeah, to be, watch and, and fun for them to do most of the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that we have any parents watching, but I think parents, if you are watching or coaches, when you're talking to your parents, um, making sure they understand that that really successful nine, 10, 11 and 12 year old is having fun doing it, not just everything predicated around winning and getting mm-hmm. the trophy and getting the, the, the time and all of that stuff. Because while I think Brian and I've hit on this before, they need to have success to stay in the sport. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Cause that nobody has fun being unsuccessful at something all the time. So they've got to have fun, but eventually those trophies are going to stop 
and eventually those ribbons are going to stop and, and whatever they're doing it for, those kind of things. And it has to be something that they want to come do and they have to take ownership of it because it's it's their sport. Um, you know, I was reading a, and there's an interesting thing from Generational Insights I was looking at, I guess, a week ago. Um, and you talked about no PE and they're not outside hanging out with their friends. So they did just a little little feedback from from people uh, from youngsters, 11 to 18 years old. And they did it over a period of time. How many times a, a year that they report going outside with friends and playing with friends? And in like the early 80s, that number was like 150 times a year. They go outside and play with their friends. 2017, they have they don't have the most recent data yet, but as of 2017, it was down like 112. So that's 50 less days that they are even doing something outside over the course of a year with friends. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're an outlet for them to be able to do that. So I think the dry land, like you said, is important, but you got to teach it right. Sure. Like I think Justin said on the show a couple last week or a couple weeks ago, you have to be savagely good at the details. Sure. For them, I think in dry land, it's a lot about just running around and jumping and, and things that they just don't do uh, anymore. And just being space. Spatial awareness is something that we just simply lack as a, as a younger group of, of society these days. And um, you can see it in how we circle swim and all that kind of stuff. It feels like we're just not very spatially aware. And so I think that, you know, if, even if the only thing dryland is teaching that is is spatial awareness, then it's a successful thing. I don't think they need to be in there throwing weight around or anything like that necessarily, but they need to be teaching, you know, they need to be learning spatial awareness and, and how to move their body, uh, whether it be on land and in the pool. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think all that stuff is good stuff. And I think you have to do that stuff now because kids just don't do it on their own. I mean, you'll have a freakish athlete come through every once in a while, but it's becoming fewer and further in between, in my opinion. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, Ryan, man, we really appreciate you jumping yeah, on you. this Monday afternoon and, and joining us. Welter, I know you got a swim meet to go try to dominate. Um, I do. I do. I'm not going to dominate anything, but hopefully the kids will do well. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, dominate. on Sundays I used to watch the Falcons play, but that's not worthwhile anymore. You can anyway, go so. dominate the hospitality suite, Welter. That's right. There you go. I'm getting ready to. That's where I'm <laughs> headed right after I get off here. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for tuning in. Uh, if we don't see you before, have a Merry Christmas, and uh, we hope to catch you guys in the next few weeks on Holding Water. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, man. Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. TV. TV. On the Monkey. <laughs>